we go. Here we go. How's everyone doing? I hope um, I hope everyone have it, is having a wonderful weekend or week. It's actually week right now. Although in some places on Earth, it's, it could still be a weekend. For us, it's uh, Monday night. And uh, it's a beautiful day or night, actually, at this point in L.A. And we have a returning, I would dare to say, alumni. <laughs> <laughs> alumni of Art Cafe. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Berube. How's, How's it going? going, friend? Yeah, it's going great. How about yourself? I am doing fantastic, dude. Um, having a blast. I am having a blast. Uh, let's see. Cool. Uh, yeah, man. We I, I, I had you on a podcast last time. It was, I think it was 2017 maybe early 2018 but it's been a while it's it's been a while since we actually had this one yeah that's right time flies like that yeah it's it's kind of insane because i remember you know chatting with you and you know we went over like many different topics um and i remember um chatting with you and it, it feels like it was a yesterday and yet here we are, 2019. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was uh, two years ago already. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's wild. Very crazy. <laughs> crazy times, man. Crazy times. Um, yeah, how's, how's everything, dude? How's, uh, how's life? How's, you know, um, how's everything? Everything is, uh, is super fun, super great. Um, more more of the same still on avatar has been uh, three years already um battle angel recently came out so that was super cool to see um all the work we put into that already three years ago finally uh, land on a big screen so that was awesome mm -hmm. and i can't wait to see uh, avatar obviously <laughs> when is that coming out was there a release date for avatar already um it's a little bit hard for me to say but i think it's in the i think it's in the the 2020 um the christmas break i would think but it's a little bit hard for me to say right we we, we you know what everyone can google <laughs> yeah everyone can go google, google uh when it happens i think there was uh there was like a preliminary release date that i've read on like entertainment weekly or something um that was that was a while ago um and i think i think I think it was like three of them coming out all at once, which is which is crazy, dude. Crazy, crazy. Yeah, stuff. it's it's pretty wild. Yeah, I think I think well, they're gonna break it up. I think the first uh, it's uh, two and three, and then four and five a little bit later. But uh, mm -hmm. it, again, it's it's hard for me to say. I think the the yeah. details on that aspect, dude. But dude, as uh, you said, um, Battle Angel came out. Yeah, a that's while right. Ago, and it's from from what I understand, it's doing pretty well. Yeah, it's awesome to see the the positive feedback from everybody. I think like I keep seeing comments on on whether it be like Facebook or Instagram or even ArtStation, and people are like, "Oh my god, I went and I've seen the movie like three or four times already," mm -hmm. and and that's that was kind of crazy to me because I did not know the manga before uh, working on the movie, right? And and I think a lot of the fans were like pretty. Um, they they just appreciated how it turned out and a lot of people kind of saw it multiple times and I, I saw it twice myself uh, and i think it's awesome yeah i remember the um, you know i was i th i think i think john um uh, james cameron had an idea of uh of doing the film like i think bef even before he went on doing avatar i remember watching one of his interviews right. where he mentioned like that's that's a franchise that he l really loves and you know he was just waiting for a right moment and then when i heard that robert rodriguez would be helming um as a director i was like oh that's actually pretty cool <laughs> that's a um, that's a super cool combination yeah yeah because i love robert rodriguez like yeah i, he's I awesome. fucking love that guy dude <laughs> Um, you know, there could be an argument from, from some people that, oh, like some of his films are not that great, but you know what? I'll tell like he, he made a couple of, uh, a couple of films that are like among my very favorites. 
And here's the kicker. I had a chance to work with Robert, like my first, actually my first film working experience yeah. was, was with him. You know, it's funny because uh, uh, same for me. My first feature <laughs> film was was with Robert. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. Yeah, yeah. he's in, uh, he's in one of the best. Yeah, he's awesome. Him and the uh, uh, Tarantino, I think I, I like mm-hmm. them both quite a lot. They they have such a unique thing going on. It's so awesome. was so was um, Battle Angel, ba- Battle Angel, right? That was the first the first film he worked with him. Uh, no, actually, I worked on Spy Kids two in oh in, okay. In 1999, I think, or, or 2000. Damn. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, and he was the uh, he was the director on that as well. Yeah. Okay. So we've okay. we've uh, been working together for. I mean, yeah. I can't say that, but... Yeah. So that's that's yeah that's way ahead of me then. Way 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 ahead. Yeah, I I had a chance to uh, work with him on this project that just never saw the you know the light of day. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I did, though. I, I know what you're talking about, and I, I wish I did because I. That was back in 2011. A... Back in 2011, dude. So many years, so many years ago. And you know what? Here's the 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 most bummer part about that is like, I I really wish, like I I'm really hoping that it's gonna lift off eventually, like maybe one of those days, like maybe it's gonna be like the Battle Angel, uh, what 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 Battle Angel was for for. For James Cameron, you know, maybe that yeah. one's gonna be what it, uh, you know, the same, uh, the, the same thing. Um, yeah, that. Like sometimes it takes a lot of time. I think I remember hearing a, a Jerry Bruckheimer in an interview that he said that it took about like ten years to make Top Gun, and it was just like a, a matter of like lining lining everything up. You know, sometimes you're waiting for an actor or or waiting for. You know, a, a studio to finally green light the production. You know, sometimes it can take a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, you, they, you, you've worked in films, well, like in the in the uh, art directors guild for at least past three years, I believe. And then prior to that, you know, you obviously were at Blizzard, but you also had you know VFX experience when it comes to film and some of the concept work you've done for film, like way, 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 way before I was like shitting in my diapers, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but you obviously know how it is, you know, like when you start working on the film, it's like it can go, it can it can go somewhere, or it can go nowhere, and you just yeah, never know. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes you got to be patient for uh, some of these uh, things to come about, Yeah, It's yeah. the creative process, and uh, sometimes there's quite a lot of money involved, and... It just uh, they're they're not easy venture to uh, to complete. That's for sure. Yeah. How um when you work in Alida, like how much of a FaceTime you actually had with Robert? I was I'm just curious. Um, you know, very little actually. We had uh, a lot of uh, interaction with Ben Proctor and uh, Dylan Cole, obviously, because they would kind of. Uh, chip in a little bit on the light storm uh, side of things mm-hmm. and if if anything i think like jim and john lando uh so james cameron and john lando would would oversee quite a lot what we would do at Lightstorm, and especially john lando and and that was such a fascinating interaction like that guy that guy is he's he's really something else like he's such like a remarkable guy and like to me i've always seen him as a producer and I didn't know him before working on Alita, and I was just mind blown about his creative input. Like he gave some of the things I was working on some of the best, most clever creative output I've ever came across. Like just like how would an audience would perceive a design, or or how they would perceive um, a shot, or or something like that, and how to really make the narrative of the story to be very loud and clear clear and in fact let, let me show you uh, i have this image on my art station here and i'm going to show you like one note that he gave me specifically that just blew my mind it was like wow i would have never let's thought go, that. man let's go okay so i don't know if you're seeing my screen right now yeah i do okay cool so on my art station uh so what is the link here so artstation.com slash uh i got a couple items on the battle angel here and this uh, character right here with the orange uh, smoke, mm-hmm. uh, he is a, a motorballer. 
um, called uh, Scar Massacus, uh, number 24 in the seven, uh, Battle 7 League or whatnot. And he, as I was designing this guy, so if you're seeing this image right here, close up of the head. Yeah. He said, he's like, you know, I like what you're doing there with the collar behind his head and things like that. But if we were to film his face with a close up shot, wouldn't that be great if we could have a little bit of negative space in his headrest so that we can see if another character is behind him, kind of chasing him? Mm -hmm. And just like that, I was like, I, I would have never thought of that. So you're, you're doing this kind of car chase looking sequence and then you want to see who's behind who thing sort of thing. And then the, the, the kind of the color design that I had for that character at the time didn't all a good visibility of the environment behind the character. So he was like, why don't you just like poke a hole in it? And I was like, wow, man, that, that's freaking genius. And it was just such a, such a big picture note. And it was just so clever. And he came up with it like so quickly and as, as if it was like the most obvious thing in the world. And, and I was just like super, super impressed by that. That like how someone can be like so business oriented and yet, like come up with notes like that that will make the image like read that much better and the story carry through so they it's it's no mistake that these people are in the position they're in because they're they're just super yeah. talented and really creative and that's very yeah. rare for a producer i'll be honest isn't that isn't that interesting and and yeah. i had that kind of preconception too you know especially you see a guy like that who like produced the titanic you know it's like oh to me it sounds like like a venture deal or somewhat of like a lot of like like business kind of you know uh collaboration deals with studios mm -hmm. and things like that and yet like he had like like super impressive notes about like either design or story or just about anything you know it's like he uh, he's been doing movies for such a long time uh, in fact i think he worked on on dick tracy like 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 a while back and that just shows you like how much how much experience and how long he's been doing this and yeah just, he's just, just awesome mentioning guy. you just mentioned he produced Titanic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that should, goes... That like, should give you an idea. Like, that should give you an idea of the scope. But at the same time, like, I remember when Dick Tracy came out and it was such a unique movie and I was like, wow, that's so cool. And I was probably like eight or nine years old or like whatever when that came out. And I was like, that. it's always been a movie that kind of left like a very, uh, like like a very specific impression on me. Mm -hmm. And and I was looking at photos of, of him on set, you know, of, of on set of Dick Tracy. He's like, wow, man, you've been at it for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's no it's no surprise that they come up with such, you know, great notes and just overall amazing creative uh, direction for just about anything they get involved on. Yeah. You know, what's crazy? Um, I, mean, I don't, it's not really crazy, but like, I think it's a it's a pretty obvious thing if you think about it. Uh, but most of the films that come out these days, most, not all of them, because there's, there's, there's a bunch of films that, uh, come out that do not mold in that idea that I'm just about to say. Um, if there is a person from the past, someone who has done, you know, a lot of films in the past, you know, a lot of classics, let's put it this way you know, pretty much an outlier, like outliers of film industry that, uh -huh. been, that, that, that have been there for past 20, 30, 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's almost a guarantee that you're going to have a film that's going to turn out to be pretty awesome. Not always, because there's, there's few directors that are, you know, their past films are some of the biggest film making icons. Uh -huh. And then the new films are like, eh, eh. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but when you said, you know, so th you could say it's surprising that you have uh, a producer, John Landau, c coming up with an idea like that. It's so clever. It's it's basically a feedback that you would normally get from a production designer, someone who does it professionally, and that's their only job, you know, versus a producer who does, that's like, chipping into something I like it's like me going to uh um uh, you know NBA game and and telling a player to do something <laughs> yeah I mean, be yeah. Like the relation to it you know yeah I mean I, again it just shows like how much like familiar 
they are with the process and how long they've been doing it because they they just like they feel right at home and they don't they don't miss a beat it's yeah. uh, it's, a, it's it's really impressive to see them kind of do what they do it's it's a, it's really humbling and super inspiring it's awesome it would be yeah it would be really interesting to know like how much of that comes comes out from the experience or you know there's maybe maybe uh underlying uh interest that we just don't know about you know like sometimes oh, yeah. you I'm, just don't I'm know sure. I'm, I'm sure there's like the the multi-faceted kind of interest you know like uh like like he even jim himself you know with all of his research and then uh going to the marinia trench and building his own submarine and things like that is like you can see that the guy has a knack for engineering and mm -hmm. and, and exploration and whatever and it's like a multi-faceted kind of interest but at the end I think that these people are able to kind of connect the dot and string them all together into this this overall better understanding of the bigger picture sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But to answer your question about the the, the Robert Rodriguez and how much interaction we've had with him, because we kind of went off on this tangent there. But uh, we we had may, most of our interaction was with Jim and John and mm -hmm. Ben Proctor and Dylan, of course, that were a, a production designer. Um. Yeah, and, talk about and, the best. <laughs> yeah, they're. Yeah, it was Dylan awesome to work ben. with. The, yeah, Dylan and Ben, they're they're awesome, and I've been looking at Dylan uh, Dylan Cole's work for for quite some time, and uh, finally I had the chance to kind of work with him directly, and that was that was something, you know, like when when he he started to share PSD files, I was like, oh shit, that's awesome, <laughs> like now. That's so rad. Dude. Yeah, yeah, it's it it's really awesome. Like we did this uh, this shot right here. I think he. That 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 was one one painting that we collaborated on uh, together. He had some really good pointers on that, and we were designing the the slum um, Iron City streets mm -hmm. of of Alita together. He was doing some views, and I was doing some other views, and it was very fun to kind of collaborate um, directly like that side by side. That was definitely a a, a checkbox. I, I was happy to check on on my list of working with him and and Ben and everybody else, of course. Yeah, Dylan is awesome. I remember I, I've met him a couple of years ago uh, in person, uh, and yeah, it's he's such a great guy. It's like the nicest person you, you will ever meet. I know, like people tend to say, like, "Oh, this guy is the nicest guy," but like, yeah, you, when you talk with Dylan, he's such a good guy. Like in oh, general, it's such like, a cool he's just dude. super oh, helpful. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's a he's a super graceful leader. I I, I like him a lot. You know, it's like always stay totally cool and collected and and just like funny guy overall like it's 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 a blast working with him yeah, for yeah. sure he's one of those dude dudes that were basically like my if you if, if you could have your art childhood childhood hero yeah if you consider being in your 20s a childhood oh yeah <laughs> yeah he would be one of those guys like him, himself oh, yeah. um Craig Mullins and there was maybe two more guys that were like really looking up to you know it's like damn like the, these guys are the shit you know like yeah they're I definitely love good. their work they were so yeah. inspiring that's what yeah. basically you know his work uh I first time saw his work when he was a matte painter for Lord of the Rings oh yeah uh, that's like the first time I, I I got familiar with his work and and I remember being super inspired by it it, to oh, a point yeah. where, like, I was just like, I need to do something in that oh, direction, yeah. you know? Yeah, um, that's when you know the influence is real. Yeah, yeah. I saw. I remember when he did this uh, this demo reel about um, the stuff he was working on at Rhythm and Use on the Daredevil, and he did all these like New York City skyline stuff, and it was all like two and a half D, and I was like, holy shit! And he he had like this like epic electric guitar soundtrack on top of it. I was like, okay, this guy, <laughs> this guy is like shredding hard. And I was like, who's that dude? And like, how old is he? Where is he? What's going on there? And and when I find out like we were the same age, I was like, oh shit, <laughs> I need to I need to pick it up here. So yeah, I've been I've been stalking his work all over the internet ever since uh, seeing that. And yeah, then he went on to do Lord of the Ring, and I was like, oh man. Yeah. Game over. <laughs> yeah. I'll just mention one more thing so we can get off his nuts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was pro like out of every every artist that I reached out when I was learning, like when I was just a kid, you know, that young teenage motherfucker who couldn't paint. Uh, I was trying to learn that and I was just reaching out to like quote unquote heroes of mine just to sort of like figure out 
if they ever reply or say something, you know. Yeah. But also just like geeking out on on their work and and maybe you know learning a lesson or two if they if they you know if they ever reply, you know, vast majority of the guys would not reply, uh, and it, I don't blame or think about that as in a negative sense at all, uh-huh. because it's like ob- especially you know over time I've learned like how busy those really prolific people get, you know, uh, especially if you become like really popular. So I remember. You know, reaching out to a bunch of people. I reached out to Craig Mullins, I think, to to him, to you know, pretty much all cast and crew of <laughs> Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, but he was the only guy who replied, who actually replied, and, Dude, and so he cool. like really read into my email. It wasn't too long of an email, but he really read into and gave me like a pretty substantial reply, talking about you know what should I do, mm. not like giving me a, a critique or or, or anything, okay. but just like a word of encouragement to be, you know, to follow. If, if I really like what I'm doing, I should follow it, you know? And I was like, fuck, yeah, let's go. Yeah, that know? guy's awesome, yeah. Dude, that's so cool. Like, as I remember, like, being, like, 19 or, or 20 or whatever, and uh, I remember emailing Doug Chang out of nowhere, and he replied, too, and that made such, like, a big impact on my whole career. I was like, you know what? Like, I would totally work for that guy just because he did that, like, freaking 20 years ago. I know he's just like a good legit leader and he's just like like humble and just down to earth and it's it's so uplifting to see these guys kind of do that and it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so you you, you jumped into uh he, like deep deep waters. You, you jumped in that mar- marine uh marine trench, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's awesome experience. I've learned I've learned so much like crazy stuff ever since I started there. It's awesome. Like I, I really did pick up all sorts of tricks by uh, from John Park or Dylan or Stephen Messing and uh, uh, Nick and Seifel and and Ben Proctor. Uh, it's been it's been super rad. And you know uh, another thing that's been like really fun too is that they they had me do uh, some some photo shoots uh, once in a while. So I shot the I had a chance to shoot the actress from uh, Battle uh, Battle Angel. Uh, so uh, Rosa Salazar. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And then um, I had a chance to shoot an actor on, on Avatar this week. That was a lot of fun too. And it was a really, really fun photo shoot. They're a little bit stressful and you can't make any mistakes sort of thing. And mm-hmm. it's just like, it's very, uh, it's like, it's like a super um, inspiring um, stress, if I can say. Like it's kind of nerve wracking. And then when everything goes well, the reward is like super, uh, super thrilling and it's like it, it makes me definitely feel alive you know like when i'm building my set i'm like okay i can't forget anything anything technically that comes up everything has to pan out and and it's it's super awesome so i've had actually the chance to kind of do a little photography gigs uh, on that project uh, uh nice. once in a while which is really cool you know it's like uh, i love that stuff anyway so super yeah, fun yeah you're you're a legit photographer by the way so <laughs> no no brainer absolute no brainer I yes. remember. I remember you were helping me with that, you know, uh, apprentice project with Lawrence Squared when I was doing a photo shoot. Um, That's right. During the photo shoot, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was that was yeah a while ago. <laughs> yeah, that came out super cool too. I I remember um, I remember seeing the uh, the pictures on your on your website. That was that was super cool. Yeah, really that fun. was fun. But you were like, I, I would say you were instrumental to a success of like because you know as an amateur uh you know when you when you try to do a photo shoot and and again like plug i guess plugging uh jinyan jinyan's uh zhang class uh, artistic photography on mm-hmm. learn squared uh you know the biggest emphasis of that class was preparation you know yeah. and even though i was trying prepare as much as i could to the teeth of how i will do the photo shoot and everything uh, I remember you were just mentioning like complete like you an average person would say like why do you even tell me this like I don't, I don't do we really need that you know like s- small items small like hey don't re- yeah. don't forget a charger don't forget this don't, like don't forget a USB cable like s- <laughs> super simple stuff and I was like I wasn't I wasn't baffled because I I remember you know learning that in the lesson. And then we had those moments during the photo shoot when you were like sort of, I would say you were almost like a supervisor there, uh, you know, yeah. helping out with, with, with the setup. Um, and, 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 you know, something would go wrong and, and we had 
you know, that item that you stressed that we should have. And I was like, okay, yeah, that yeah, makes and, sense. That makes yeah, sense. And I, funny enough is I've, I've, I've kind of learned those things over over time because like how much they kind of fucked me <laughs> before <laughs> like if if you have like an important shoot with a client like and let's say you have like a like an important actor on set or 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 you rented a location you know for a specific time of day and and something technical kind of goes wrong it can jeopardize the whole plan so quickly like i've had I've had like a, a, a small list of of, of a heart attack item that came up that were the most impossible, inexplicable, technical, bogus bullshit that came up. There's one time um, I had a, cam a, a compact flash memory card that would not format for some mysterious reason. Mm -hmm. we, like we had to we had to get rolling with the cards, you know, because all the drives were full and and whatever, and and one card would not all the way us to reformat the card. And it's like, I've never seen this. I don't know what the hell is going on. And I remember like, like wasting a lot of time because it's like all the other cards are already loaded. And then if we, if we dump the stuff now, and that was on the Arri Alexa um, camera. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if we dump the stuff with the, with the drive, that, that, that can take a good amount of time. So we just need that specific card to just format and then i remember like there's like three of us around the camera it's like why is this card won't format and it's like oh the quick format has a different kind of firmware than the other format and then and then finally we figured it out but because of that my last shot was like a slightly different time of day like as opposed to be golden hour it was a little bit more like a blue hour oh and, and that's a big deal <laughs> it's a and huge deal it's like yeah it's like yeah you can fix this in di and then maybe you can like you know put a little bit of flair on your hotspot or whatever so it's it's salvageable and then we've done enough like visual effects to kind of do sky replacement and things like mm -hmm. that so it's it's okay to to pull it off but if we can save all the all the headache on in post you know we're, we're that much better off and and i had another one um let me think here oh yeah i had the you know those lassie thunderbolt drive like one yeah, drive yeah, 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 yeah. it would simply not mount and i'm like i don't understand like like i've mount this drive hundreds of times and now that i'm on set today on my laptop i plug in the drive and it doesn't show up and for some reason like the little you know mounting firmware sequence was just busted for for some reason and we ended up figuring that out too but those like you know 15 20 minutes that that you you waste trying to figure shit out they can cost you you know like big uh big items you know on, on your production so now it's like I, i've heard this thing at nasa once that ever since I heard that I've been I've been doing all my photo shoot like like NASA would mm -hmm. and it says I think it's Alex Alvarez who told me that that at NASA that's what they do they have this quote that says um just, two is just one. to interrupt you real quick for everyone who doesn't know Alex Alvarez CEO of Noman that's right Noman School of uh, Visual Effects yes yep. so he uh, he said at NASA they have this saying that goes two is one and one is none so if you bring one camera and it breaks, then you're left with none. If you bring two, one breaks, you still have one. Yeah. So every time I go on set to do a photo shoot, whatever, I always have to. I have the D3 and the D4. So if the mm -hmm. D4 kind of takes a shit on me, I can just at least fall back on the D3 and play it as if nothing is happening and everything's all good. Right. But if you were to have only one, you'd be screwed. And and you don't want those things to happen. So now I, I try to over plan and try to plan everything double so that these things you know, don't fail, you know, so because you, you can't afford to. Yeah. So, so they're fun, like, like kind of stressful and like super fun at the same time and kind of thrilling. So it's a, uh, keeps me alive, I suppose <laughs> you could say, <laughs> I guess for those who don't have like never done photography, it's like having a Photoshop file that you don't save for a long while and then hoping yeah. and hoping everything's going to go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah the, it's quite don't try yeah. that at home. Just save, just please save, <laughs> save stuff. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Like having a backup is so important. Um, it's so important in this business, especially on photo shoot. Like you, you know, we I was like we were having like a minor problems, and again, that was like an amateur photo shoot. That you know, it, it, if even if it went wrong, I, I would still have enough you know, to, to have a presentation. Um, but like, if you go and, and do an actual 
commercial shoot just like the amount of stress that goes into i can totally relate to what you said like those were like really stressful moments but also super yeah, yeah. rewarding it's like yeah yeah dude it's one thing goes wrong and you're screwed yeah and it's almost like like sometimes like when you get these weird like hey why the hell is this card won't yeah. format you know it's like i've done this a hundred times and of course right now this has to happen like the complete anomaly right like the black swan event like i feel you get even more nervous and then you start to to think about like overthink it sometimes and it's just like uh, so many things could go could go wrong it's it's really yeah important to plan everything out yeah and with professional shoots if something goes wrong, it's not only your time, it's not only your model's time. Like, obviously, in amateur shoots, you're going to have model and friends helping you out. Now it's money on the line. It's not only Yeah, with a client, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, so it's super awesome because it, it really makes you kind of... Um, you kind of um, just get, like, very disciplined about, like, the most kind of mundane kind of task, you know? It's like, right. because even... like, And that's kind of what I was stressing out over your shoot is, like, you think that a small item is kind of insignificant, but it's like, oh man, you, you'll need your charger because you'll never know. And then sure thing, you know, some, some stuff goes, goes out of battery and you don't have the char the charger or you don't have the laptop because you ran out of memory card. And it's like, oh, that's fine. Just dump everything on the laptop. It's like, oh, we don't have a USB cable to do that. It's like, yeah. oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, because I mean, for those who, who are listening that this stuff kind of sounds obvious, I think about if you're to do like a, sh a photo shoot for guests, uh, let's say uh, guest jeans, and then that takes place in the middle of the desert. I mean, to bring a laptop and all the cables and all the stuff in the desert, all of a sudden is like, oh shit, we didn't think about that. You know, it's like, oh, we don't have any power there. What are we gonna do? So it it, it adds up pretty quickly, like the the number of of items that can totally screw you. And we had that during that shoot. I think we actually forgot, or I forgot, the USB cable. And I think Andrew went to like Best Buy <laughs> to just buy one. Yeah, just and yeah. we were just lucky so that the Best Buy was not too far. Um, yeah, I, I had one this week, like a small, a small little item that came up that had me puzzled for the longest time, and then finally, like, so the shoot was taking place over two days. So I, I had a chance to shoot on Wednesday and then on on Thursday, and. I was able to figure out Thursday night, but it, it had me ponder for quite some time. So I have this like pro photo flashback. I think it was the same setup that we use on your shoot. And um, so my camera to control all the strobes, it's a, it's a radio frequency. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I had like four strobes on set and one of them would misfire every like five or six shots. And I was like, I can't, I can't have that right now. Cause like the, the lighting gets a little bit inconsistent. And I couldn't figure it out for the life of me what it was. And I think at the end, it was that there was so much like Wi-Fi signal in like the avatar building that I think I was just running into some interference. So I had to basically change my my radio channel so that I'm I'm further away from from the other channels so that I don't get like kind of cross signal kind of thing. It took me a, it took me a little bit. Uh, a little bit of time to figure that one out but it's like that's so strange all of a sudden one of my light doesn't fire i'm like what the hell is going on and and again they've been firing fine every day for the last year but then that that one day this like black swan event happened again yeah so entertaining to say the least and that's something you have to be prepared for as well you know yeah either with knowledge or equipment yeah it's yeah. true it's true uh, how much? How much of that work you st you're still? I mean, obviously you're still continuing photography. Uh, you know, now you're working in the film industry. Uh, you've been, you know, VFX. You were VFX director at Blizzard before. Um, how much photography you, you still do? If you, you know, I don't know how how much is compared to uh, the amount of photo shoots you would do in the past. I was just curious. You know, it's actually it's actually more more and more. Um, mm -hmm. I like I, I have another small one tomorrow, and uh, and then we had like two last week, and then before that I think it, it might have been like um, another one that we did for uh, for a presentation we needed to 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 put together at work. So that was like probably a couple months, but yeah, it's definitely picking up, and it's it's cool because I like it a lot. And now it's like every time I do one, I I learn new stuff, and it. It's like still fresh enough to to apply it on the next one. So I'm I feel like I'm I'm learning a little bit more. I'm learning faster because I do it more often. 
And so I'd probably say like like one 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 a month aside from all the the VFX stuff. I'd mm. say that's a lot. That's, yeah, that's not a little amount for sure. Yeah, you know, it sounds funny because like you would think like someone like full time would be like, oh, what are you talking about? I do like five or six a week, and it's like, yeah, but I think those shoots are a little bit more. Uh, there, there's a little. It 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 almost feels like a commercial shoot, like a like a TV commercial shoot. You know, it's 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 not the same amount of of equipment, but it mm-hmm. it certainly feels the same in terms of the amount of crates and stuff you got to carry around and put together and and disassemble at the end of the day. But yeah, it's picking up. It's it's uh, it's good fun. Yeah, I mean, someone would think a month is like, yeah, it's it's not that many. But if you think about if you are doing professional shoot and you have to do all the preparation, it, it takes a lot of time to get everything organized. It's like getting the model, getting yeah. everything, putting putting together, putting together a photo shoot is like ninety percent of work usually. Yeah, yeah. And I got I got another small one tomorrow, and then I got another pretty big one over the weekend. Mm-hmm. And that should be that should be fun. That one's a, a cinematography one. So nice. uh, some 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 co-directing stuff. Uh, I get the chance to bust out the red on that one. So that'll be that'll be a lot of fun. Do you enjoy photography or filmmaking more? You know, that's a that's a super interesting one. Like I feel okay. So I feel like photography would be like environment concept art. And then the the film version is obviously the moving, you know, virtual set kind of 3D matte painting equivalent, right? So Mm -hmm. one of them, you introduce motion, which is a completely other dimension, essentially. You you, you introduce motion over time. So with the time element, it's it's a completely different uh, medium just because of the time uh, factor alone. And I like the, the photography is really fun because you can get sort of crafty with it. Mm-hmm. Like you can, you know, like tweak a light until it's just right. Whereas on on a on a moving shot, you, you you think you would be doing that as well, but because things are moving, like it's a little bit more organic or fluid. Like sometimes, like an actor performance, it, you know, the actress or actor is going to behave a certain way that all of a sudden her head turn doesn't catch, you know, the the lighting on on her cheek as well as you could craft that on the photography per se. Right. Um, but at the same time, you get kind of, you know, happy accident or sometimes once things start moving, it's just so entertaining to look at anyways that it doesn't matter, but it's 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 a different beast. You know, it's, it's not like cinematography is more than photography. It's different. And I like the, I like the motion a lot because you get to play with uh, with image composition, which is I'm like completely fanatical about image composition. And mm-hmm. when it comes to adding motion, it's almost like animated graphic design. And once you start to reveal the dimensionality of the items in your set or in your your setting or whatever, you're you're basically doing like image composition and graphic composition and layouts, but using like depth and motion at the same time so it gets like very complicated which to me is more challenging and kind of rewarding if that makes sense yeah it absolutely does it's like painting versus animating you know yeah i mean for the the lack of the better you know uh yeah, just like animating like animating a camera in cg you know all the sudden is like okay there's the you know the animation curves and the framing and it's kind of is that there's so many moving parts that it's 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 a whole other kind of dense to get graceful with with the the you know the arrangement of the elements on screen. It's a little bit more, it's a little bit more kind of organic and unstable in in some ways, which yeah. which I really enjoy. It's a little bit more like jazz music than than photography. Photography feels a little bit more controlled and and a little bit more rigid to me because it's it's uh, static in time mm. essentially. So. Yeah, I can totally see that with photography versus, you know, filmmaking. It makes absolute sense because like with filmmaking, you still have to control the same aspects as you would control in photography. You still have to be sure that the lighting is there, that, um, you know, all the preparation that goes into a photo shoot is done in the exact same way. But then, as you said, introducing the aspect of time, meaning now the objects are moving, now things can go out of frame, now you have to frame things correctly. Uh, something can, uh, you know, creep 
into a frame that now you mm -hmm. have to figure out like how to replace that. There's just like outside of just, you know, designing the shot, you're actually you have to design the motion. And then then there's aspects of what goes into the motion as well, which is, you know, correct timing. Uh, and then like afterwards editing, there's just so many extra layers. Yeah. And it's almost like variables that are added on top of everything you already That's have right. to control correctly. That's right. That's exactly right. It's like having one extra control that can, if you move the slider a little bit too high or a little bit too low, it will just fuck up the shot, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I'm also like super fanatical about uh, color grading in the DaVinci Resolve. I'm like obsessed with that shit. Like it's so, it's so amazing what, what, what the software can do and how it works. It's like Lightroom is super cool. Like I really enjoy Lightroom and for, for photography and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I do a little bit of my grading in the Capture NX and then a little bit in Lightroom and, and whatnot for stills. But for when it comes to like motion or filming with the Alexa or the Red, like to go in Resolve, uh, DaVinci Resolve and then push the tones around and the stuff you can do in there it's really like um, it's it's really the other half of of DP um, of mm -hmm. directing a photography. Like I was telling, I was chatting with my friend uh, Matthias uh, Vereselt. Um, we get to carpool every day. He uh, he goes to SpaceX, and then I go <laughs> to uh, to Avatar, and then we have these like epic conversation in the carpool every time. And I was telling him, you know, on the day that I that I was done with my my photo shoot on Avatar, I was like, you know what I like so much about lighting is that you get to design the gradients of every single form of your subject. But what's cool about color grading is you get to design the gradient inside the gradient because by changing the curve or whatever, you can totally redistribute the 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 tones in a different way that they were captured. If If you want to, you can make it more you know, a, a softer uh, Terminator shadow or a harder one or or, or you have it more in a, in a, in a, a S-curve looking thing or more of a logarithmic kind of kind of fall off or whatnot. And it's like a whole other tier on top of it. And eventually that's how that's how I think you can come up with your own look in photography or cinematography is like the combination of how you light it and how you grade it becomes its own kind of thing that it, it'd be hard for someone else to kind of replicate because it's too, it's too intricate. And, right. and I, I really enjoy that stuff. Like for whether it be for photography or, or cinematography, like just the DI is just insane. Like that stuff is so cool. Do you find yourself when you do that? Obviously I know how much color grading can change the shot. It's like, you know, when you, when you work in the Photoshop file, you know, to, for lack of a better word, you, you know, adding adjustment layers can, can really change the way the image feels. Um, but do you find yourself, you know, with having more and more experience with color grading and obviously there's different layers of it again, like I guess Lightroom is amazing. Um, da Vinci is the software that's as far as I'm concerned is, is using VFX pretty much as a, you know, yeah, baseline. pretty much every uh, every uh, well, there I think there's like two or three I think that are kind of a, a standard. You have a color uh, DaVinci Resolve will will put out most picture you see out there in the theater. There's yeah. also a base light um, that I know I know I think all the Harry Potter movies were graded in base light, and I, I believe uh, um, with Peter Doyle I think who's just a, a fantastic colorist. And I think the the Lord of the Ring might have been done in base light as well, mm -hmm. but I'm not too familiar with that product. I've never used it myself. I've only seen kind of interviews and stuff that I researched. Uh, right. I'm more familiar with the the Da Vinci and then the you know the Star Wars looking stuff and then the Transformers looking stuff. That's all the uh, Stefan Sonnenfeld over at uh, Company Three um, in Santa Monica, and they, they they're all the uh, uh, Da Vinci Resolve over there. Uh, but yeah, going back to a question, uh, do you find yourself? relying on that more or less over time like the more you learn the intricacies of how color grading helps you with the shot does it does it inform you back like maybe there's some aspects of lighting or preparation for the shoot or filming that i have to do or can do differently so that i have less uh post effects work okay that's that's a that's a super good question i think i can think of like two to handle on that. So 
one is once you discover what these things can do, it's like it's like the favorite new toy. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> we need to do this on everything we do because it's so awesome and it elevates the look so much and lens it does flare create everywhere. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. Lens flares everywhere. Yeah. So color grading everywhere. And um and once you see what it can do and, and it to me it's really what makes a picture look inexpensive. It, a lot of it will happen in the DI. And if your colors are proper properly managed with all the color spaces and all that, you're really you're you're really gonna bang out the the maximum fidelity of just about anything you capture mm -hmm. but also i've had i have seen some things where and and that's probably coming from such a like a 10 year of like you know vfx art direction or whatever um i have made some some calls on on some of the avatar asset that i was working on that are uh, practical build so they're being like manufactured and put together for real mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. You know, we have to choose like a specific material for, let's say, like an anodized aluminum, let's say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're like, oh, do you like this red or this anodized red? Because I've, I've done the shaders in Keyshot and things like that. And now it's a, a matter of uh, proofing the, the real version and, and giving our direction notes on that and whatnot. Yeah. And there are certain times where I was like, you know what, let's go with the more saturated one because it's always easier to kind of snag it in DI and then tone down the saturation mm. than it is to bring it up. Because if you don't have it in the camera and then the signal is kind of weak, it, it's hard to bring it back from the dead. Whereas an item that's a little bit more vivid is very easy to isolate with a color vector and just treat it as a secondary and just kind of knock it right. down just a little bit or, or push it around where you need it to be. But, but if the color is timid to start with, it's going to be a little bit more challenging to, to, to put into place where, where you want it to be. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like if you think about um, the filming process and, you know, there's obviously if, if you work on a high budget production, um, there's, there's obviously more budget that goes towards the materials, but also more budget that goes to into picking the right cameras and, you know, top of the line lenses that allow you to capture most if not everything that you can capture in there you know there is for those who who you know dabble in photography or had at least the chance to use a little more than your iphone camera uh you know you would understand that there's a huge difference in terms of you know picking a a few year old dslr that has specific yeah. dynamic range that is limited dynamic dynamic range versus let's say the new sony uh, A7Rs, uh, you know, a, A7R3 or A7S3 or A7 III, like one of the, the top of the line, the new ones that have incredible dynamic range. Yeah, and you know, like, uh, funny enough, I, I was just researching um, about this stuff uh, uh, yesterday because I, I personally shoot with a Nikon D4 uh, at the moment, and I think that I, I squeezed just about every pixel I could get out of that thing that I'm starting to consider getting a new body. And I was like, oh, am I going to pick up a D5 or or what, what's out there? And I remember, um, I don't know if I have it on here. Um, I remember shooting this thing for, oh, here we go. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, there we go. So that was a that was a set there that we did for uh, some of the uh, intuitive surgical Mm -hmm. uh, shoot way back when when uh, Vitali was working there as an industrial designer and then we ended up like shooting some of the instruments and then um, some of the the robots and things like that and at the time I rented a um, a phase one uh, camera a phase one IQ 180 and that's a $55,000 digital uh, yeah. medium format <laughs> digital film back how how much and, that one cost <laughs> I don't want to know yeah, yeah, fifty five thousand. Yeah, for yeah. just the for just the the film back. Oh and, my god! And I remember that's like, not including it, lenses, by the way. That's not including lenses, and then I, I did not buy that. I just rented it for like yeah. a week or something. And I remember being completely blown away by the the picture that it did output because mm -hmm. everything everything was different on that camera. Like first of all, it's a sixteen bit um, format. Uh, and I think it saves a, a TIFF, like a half float TIFF or something in, in 16 bit. Whereas your your Sony A7S or, you yeah, know, like Canon 10 -bit, Mark yeah. 3 
yeah, you're going to get 10 bit or, or maybe sometime 12 or maybe 14. But even in the case of a, of a 14 bit, I think that if I'm not um, mistaken, I think that two of the bit are uh, exponent mm -hmm. to basically apply somewhat of a, an exponential kind of, you know, look up uh, for you to squeeze more values, whatever, but it's actually not um, like real, real range. Whereas the 16 bit is, is a full on 16 bit per channel. Like all the bits in the 16 bit are used per channels. And the resolution was around like 10 K. And I remember like the gradients that like the, the quality of any sort of gradient, like you would not pick up any sort of, um, image bending whatsoever, no posterizing whatsoever. It was super, super creamy and just like insane, like just insane quality and a 10K resolution on top of that. But that software, like to talk, to come back to the color grading thing, like it had its own software. I don't know if I still have it installed. I think I might have lose it over time. It's but phase one software, I think. I yeah, the phase, uh, I think it's called uh, 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 Capture or something. And I, yeah, I can Capture show One, I think. Yeah, 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 Capture One, that's it. So phase one, and the one I had at the time was the IQ 180, um, which is like, like the most kind of awkward looking camera body and it's it's not very comfortable to use and it's it's a little bit clumsy um i think that's the one that i had right here yeah it, it looks like this and it's so rudimentary it's kind of weird like there's no okay so get this so there's no autofocus on it so every shot had to be focused on manually mm -hmm. and that was like super stressful because you have a, a big client you know they're they're paying kind of top dollar for for their pictures to be tight and I have to eyeball all that stuff. And then thank God I had um, a, a DIT with me who would basically full screen on a, on an iMac pro every shot that I would, that I would take would come up on the computer instantly. So we shot a tethered that it's called. So there's a cable connected yeah. to the camera and then his sole job that day was Just to zoom in. <laughs> Zoom in at 100% to make sure that, you know, everything is tack sharp and then also to mouse over the highlights to make sure that I'm not clipping out of the 16-bit the uh, uh, range, you know, so to make right. sure that the highlights are not blown out and things like that. But the funny part is that though the, and you can see the, so this is the digital background here and this kind of clips on um, onto the body and um, you can see here, um, like, okay, so here's from a side view. This is a tilt shift lens, but let's not get carried away for, with that for a second. But you can see the module in the back right here is the, the digital sensor and the size of this thing. Like when you look at the, the sensor itself, so let me see if I can, I can pull this up real quick. Isn't it like, like twice if, bigger or like three times bigger than a regular sensor? Well, yeah, it's the, it's the classic two inch, uh, you know, medium format. It's that, so insane. You know, so 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 if you look at the pink one right here, I think that's probably your classic kind of you know, uh, twenty four millimeters yeah, full, by by thirty six. You know, the full frame, thirty five millimeter full frame. But like this thing is you know almost the size of an IMAX film neg, you know, on a still camera, and that's why the resolution is so insane. I'm trying to see if you can see the the sensor itself because I remember when I cleaned it, I was like, oh my god, this thing is huge. <laughs> like, it looks it looks like this. You see it right here. <laughs> it's like a small. Oh yeah, TV. there you go. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, it's like a small TV. Yeah. So this one's a Hasselblad. So that, that one's a little bit different. But you can see the size of it. And then yeah, you can see insane. like the body. The body right here is just this this box essentially with like a handle grip on, on it. And look at the, the ergonomic, the product design and how rudimentary it is. Like the little rotating dial over here. And, and, and I don't know what button that is, if that was like a metering button or whatever. But if you compare that with the design of like a let's say like a, a Nikon D5 and I'm sure Canon does good stuff, but I'm, I'm biased for Nikon. I think their ergonomic is way better. But here, if you look at the, let's say the D, D5 or the D4, like it, so you know, it buttons. has, the, you know, so many buttons, but not only that, like just the, just the flow of the, the design, you know, is it, it's so ergonomic and beautiful. Like it, it looks yeah. like a handgun or something, you know, and then the other one is just this freaking t TV from the seventies, you know, <laughs> and, and when you hold it, it feels like that too. It's 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 amazing to me the the contrast and pricing versus product design. Yeah, and it's almost like they've allocated all the budget on the sensor, which is <laughs> which is okay because that's what that's what we went we we rent the camera for. 
but at the same time, it was kind of clumsy to to operate. But uh, all this to say, at the end of the day, the the picture was just like insanely sharp, and I can show you like um, like a, a quick example of of how insanely sharp that is. If I go on my my website right here, there's a Flickr uh, button at the top, and if I um, if I go there, let me find it real quick. Um, uh, let me see here. That's it already a couple of years ago. So you got to give me a second. Yeah, for sure. Take your time, bro. Oh, you see that stormtrooper? That's Vitaly, by the way. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Isn't that Vitaly. cool? Yeah. I love that guy. Oh yeah. He's awesome. I saw him a couple of, like a, a week ago or something. Nice. Did you go to, yeah. uh, Vegas, Vegas? No, we went to, uh, we went to Palm Spring. We had a little, oh, nice. uh, R &R. a little offsite. R and R little awesome. team team retreat, and uh, it was cool to to catch up with them. Okay, there you go. Okay, so so this is this is a picture of uh, Roman Lapev here. He's a industrial designer at Intuitive Surgical. He's a good friend of Vitali as well. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at the background in the gradient, you see how soft the gradient is. Like that's the phase one for you. Like that's how smooth it's gonna render. Yeah. a gradient on screen there's no you know when you do a gradient in photoshop let's say on a regular 8-bit you're going to see a lot of like shifts and hues and a little bit of color bending on the gradient yeah. because you know if you're a matte painter you're you're trying to do a sky shot at night and it's all gradient you're going to see a lot of bending Segments. and posterizing in, in, yeah. in your yeah the steps in, in the gradient right so this is due because you got an 8-bit per channel and you know that's the number of shades of gray that you have at your disposal to create your gradient. So if you bump that up to 16 bit, a lot of it is going to go away. So this one basically does that in the camera. And just to show you like the 10K resolution. So if you look at Roman's eye right here, like that's what that looks like. Yeah, pretty juicy, pretty juicy eye. <laughs> oh, but yeah, I don't know if it came up on your on your end already. Are you are you seeing my stuff in real time or? Yeah, yeah, I do. Oh, okay. So, and then this is the, um, yeah, you can see, you see like this is the, the, they call it the loop, like the magnifying glass, whatever. So this is zoomed in at a hundred percent on the eyeball over there as I'm in the capture one, the, the software there. Yeah. And you can see like already the, the whole histogram of the level and the, the, just the, the template of that software, like the control is so much more and it's, uh, it's amazing. It's a, it's a whole other ball game and I, I love it. So to go yeah. back to color shading and things like that, it's, uh, that's that's the one it's pretty rad you know i have uh a7 r a7 r2 which is i think 7k images uh so it's pretty close to medium range in terms of resolution but you know i remember talking with genia about this uh because i was you know i was i had my phase where i was super obsessed about photography oh yeah and um <laughs> I'm, I'm still in that phase I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's great though that's great um, and I, I, I'm thinking about getting back to it because it's like, I remember just even that small, uh, that short period of time where I was like absolutely obsessed. Uh, you know, I still, I still try to do photography every now and then when I have a, when I have a chance, but I don't obsess about it anymore, but I'm kind of like feeling the itch, if you know what I mean. Oh, um, yeah. but I, you know, I remember, you know, talking about medium versus regular for like full frame format that is just it's just mm -hmm. like the fidelity of the image is completely different you know the oh, 50 yeah. millimeter lens feels like something else completely something else i remember her saying that so obviously you cannot compare the two because it's like you know apples and oranges yeah but, well it'd be like imax and regular 35 millimeter i guess you could say right and the use is different too like medium camera yeah. is something you would never use for sports or motion uh, yeah, it'd be exactly. extremely difficult to do, or even I guess filming, right? Filming would be really difficult on on a camera like that, uh, because of the That's limitations. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's not it's not fast, and then the files are so big that it takes a little bit of time be yeah. before they transfer to the to the memory card, and that there's the, there's a whole latency thing that you need to synchronize to make sure the transfer is taking place. And yeah, so they're they're a little bit clumsy, funny yeah. enough. Yeah, 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 but they're like it's a completely different. I guess hardware for completely different thing. It's not, it's not something you would use for for uh, for film, but it's definitely a big step up if you want to do like a product photography, right? Oh yeah, oh um, yeah. That's that or Hasselblad. It's yeah. uh, it's it's definitely the way that the, the pro pro work is done. I think for any sort of magazine or billboard where right where you or a movie poster perhaps like you you need that resolution and 
that's that's definitely the way, way to go but it's it's easier to it's easier to use if you are in somewhat of a more controlled setting like if you are mm. in the studio it's a little bit easier but but outside in the wild that might be a little bit more challenging i'm right. sure there's plenty of people that do it but uh, i find for me personally i find like the, the nikons and things like that are more suited for that type of work have you um have you tried uh any of the sony cameras the, the recent ones you know a friend of mine has a, a sony a7s and that's a and that's that I find interesting because there's, aside from the the crazy impressive, uh, you know, ISO uh, yeah, capabilities. It's, it's basically a night vision at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that it's bananas, dude. That that's super impressive, and then the the dynamic range is awesome. The the one thing that I feel kind of alienates me a little bit is the the fact that the, a lot of those nowadays are like mirrorless. So, yeah, so you are. you no longer have like the flapping kind of mirror mechanism inside, right? So yeah, so that tells me that that's a mo and and I'm no expert on the matter. So maybe you know this or because because I don't own uh, one of those myself. I don't own a mirrorless uh, a full frame yet. But correct me if I'm wrong. But isn't it like an uh, electronic signal that feeds you the image to your uh, to the viewfinder? Mm. No, I think it just goes directly from the lens to uh well yeah, so so the viewfinder no, so the viewfinder is uh, electronic. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because the the mechanism can't you you can't you can't see through the lens because that's where the 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 sensor is. Yeah. Uh, but you know then, so, the the benefit of that I I'll say this. So I like the optical viewfinder obviously. It's it's awesome. But I'll tell you you know, there's the, there is a electronic viewfinder that is good, and the electronic viewfinder that is bad. The bad one is the one that has a lag. Uh, and, uh -huh. and, and some of the older cameras, I remember the first electronic viewfinder camera I had was a, a Fuji Fujitsu. Okay. Um, it was like a it looked like a you know old school. I can't remember the exactly. It was like X one or something. I can't remember. It was a pretty old one from like seven a eight years X1? ago. An X one. Yeah. X1 or so I can't remember exactly. I would have to dig it up, uh, but it was like one of the first electronic viewfinder, like not not the first, but like one of the earlier ones. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and I remember that that aspect of it was really annoying that there is yeah. there was a delay. But yeah, I'll you tell you the, the 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 recent ones, not, not even the recent ones. The, the the Sony the Sony camera I have uh, the AR A A seven R two. Which is like five five year old camera at this point. It's instant. Like there's it's the, the the biggest benefit I found of having that. So there's there's a lot of different benefits, obviously attached to it. But a what you see is what's what's the file is gonna look like. So it's almost like if you're looking through the viewfinder, uh, the electronic viewfinder. It's I you, see. you know what what the photo is gonna look like. So you can adjust the settings. Uh, you know, ex exposure, all of those things while looking through it. Instead oh, of, isn't and, that? And you're not guessing. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Actually, I did not think of that aspect. I was going to say the the one thing that I I felt a little bit alienated alienated by was the f it was more on the image composition side of things that because it's hmm. being filmed and displayed, it it is not exactly what the lens sees so no, therefore it's, so it's opposite so like if you think about the regular viewfinder um you know like if you're aware how everything works within the camera and you you have experience with it then it doesn't really matter like it obviously matters what you see through the regular viewfinder uh but you can guess what the result's going to be like you know if you're overexposing or not not overexposing by just looking at the meters and you can see, okay, like I'm overexposing, even though it's not that dark in the viewfinder, right? Versus right, right. on electronic viewfinder, it's exactly like you you know right away, because it just is it's what it's gonna look like uh, in the actual file. So it shows you what the file is gonna be like, and it's not like an approximation; it's actually what it's gonna be like. And obviously, it's actually the file, yeah. Yeah, so there's obviously a limitation in terms of like what the what's the resolution of the the viewfinder, like all of those things. Uh, matter to a certain point, but I found you know because I I used um, you know when we did that photo shoot I was on the uh, uh, 5D Mark II, and right. and then 
you know, short, not shortly after, but like a year or two after I got the A7R2. Uh, and dude, the, the difference was big in terms of like usability and ability to capture uh, a moment without guessing if my exposure is correct. It was huge to me. Wow, that's in it. That's interesting because it just removed all the guesswork for me. Like if you wow, wow, if you wow. change lenses, you know, um, all like certain lenses behave differently. Sometimes oh, yeah. the difference is not big, but it, but there there still is some differences. Oh, yeah. You know, with the different lighting, you have you have different reaction of the sensor towards the lighting. So you might be thinking that you're not overexposing, but you really, really are, unless you're looking at the histograms. Um, but yeah, with this was just like, oh yeah, like that's a, like for, even for, it makes it super easy for amateurs. It makes uh -huh. it, it makes it, so I, I would say this, it makes it super easy for amateurs. It makes it incredibly convenient for professionals. Wow, that's cool. Because that sounded like, like that sounded like a branding campaign right there. Like you could, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you could put that on the billboard for for Sony. Here's the kicker. One of the yeah. features that I never expect would be the one that like, oh my god, this is the best thing ever when it comes to manual, uh, um, you know, focusing, was the um, focus peaking. Oh yeah. It, it, like to me, it was a dark match, like dark arts of photography that Dude, just that's like came out through uh, viewfinder. Because the way so... it works, it <laughs> creates like a red-ish outline uh -huh. around where you where you have the, the where it's tack sharp. Wow, that's so cool! Like I don't have that on my D four, but um, I have a I have a slightly different, maybe a little bit older. Um, I have Should like I get the, sponsored the, by the... Sony, by the way. I'm just plugging it so hard. No, no, no. I'm sponsored by Nikon. <laughs> Send me free no, stuff. I mean, God damn it. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah Sony, if you're listening, give me shit. <laughs> yeah, give like, me I, I saw this quote the other day that says, like, all my friends are getting married, and I'm like, I need more camera gear. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, you know, yeah. you should try it. Like, I, I think you would like it. It's the only, I'll tell you, you will be annoyed with the ergonomics. Uh, that that I can guarantee oh, you'll man. be annoyed with. Okay, that's that's super big. Like for me, I'm like an ergonomic because freak. I don't know what it is, but I have a total pet peeve about like product design. That if it's not, if if the if the flow of when you grab the thing doesn't feel right, I'm like I get kind of annoyed because I feel it's like the only job that there is to be done on like product design sort of thing. And if it if it feels off, I'm like totally annoyed. Right. Yeah, it's way smaller, way lighter. If you have a heavy lens, you almost like you're. It's almost like you're working with the lens only. <laughs> wow, it's see, but so to me, small. like, like funny enough, like I actually prefer the bigger DSLR body because I shoot portrait quite a lot. And mm -hmm. then with with the let's say the Nikon D4, for example, uh, you get the. Um, so I, I have a. Let me kind of pull it up here. I have the vertical handle is actually built in the body. Um, so it really helps, in fact, towards distributing the weight nice and evenly. So, right. so you can see here. So here's the D5, right? So this this is your your landscape handle grip, and then when you rotate it portrait mode, you have the same grip, and then you see the rotating right. dial over here is the same as this one. But what happened is that when you look at the mass distribution, is like it looks like a square, and then the the lens is in the middle. So yeah. it actually feels balanced all the way around. So no, no, no matter how like which side you kind of hold it, it actually feels the same. Yeah. If you want to pull out an yeah. A7R two or three, you will see you will see what uh, what the body looks like. It's pretty small. I think the balance is okay. I don't think the balance is off at all. You you can get the battery grip, battery grip as well. So you're gonna get that square aspect to it if you wanted to. But I would uh -huh. say you know I I think you actually had um like somewhere before I saw like a, yeah, there you go. Like if you scroll down, scroll down a little bit, you, you'll see like A7R and Canon, like the, the size difference, dude. Oh, I see these. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah here. Here. Yeah. There yeah. Yeah. Go. Okay. So perfect. That's a, that's a super good analogy. Like, so to me, like when I look at this, it's like it, it trips me out because like, so for example, the, the shoot we did on, on Wednesday, like I didn't, I didn't, 
necessarily have a big lens mounted on. I had like my 7200 zoom lens for a portion of the shoot, and then I switched over to my uh, full frame prime uh, 85 mm-hmm. mil because it's prime lens, it's a little bit sharper on the edges. And it's it's kind of a heavy rig, but like when I look at this, like I feel like I'm gonna drop it. Like and I kinda <laughs> have big hands too, and I feel that yeah, like the if grip I was, is pretty small. You know, when I look at this grip right here, so I feel like I have like so my index is gonna be in this area. I feel I'll probably have one support finger over here, and I feel like my two other fingers might just like slip off the bottom. Yeah, I think I you think know? if that's really important, you would have to have a battery grip because that helps. I, I have yeah. a battery grip with my camera, so it definitely makes it feel like you're ha- you have a full grip. If yeah, I don't you see, have like, that, I have big hands too. Like my 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 pinky um, is like not touch almost not touching the camera. It's almost touching the bottom of it, which is make, yeah. makes it awkward. But I'll tell you, you know, I got used to it, and I think. Um, yeah, I see your I, pinky is underneath, huh? Yeah, so like, yeah. I guess it's a, it's a matter of like getting, like adjusting to it. But to me, it was worth, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be on like Sony's nuts uh, on this. Obviously, I am obviously am because I just basically pretty much retired my whole Canon collection for it. It was just like the, the technical benefits of using that camera for me specifically wow. were so vastly above and beyond what Canon was offering I was like, dude, it's a no brainer to switch. No, no brainer. And here's a kick. Wow, right? That's interesting. You, you take that camera and you put like Google, uh, Zeiss 35 millimeter, uh, T planner or uh, 2.8, just Zeiss 2.8, 35 millimeter. Oh, is that this stuff right yeah. here? So when you put this thing on that camera, it's basically a point and shoot, but with Zeiss tack sharp lens. <laughs> Wow, that lens looks so funky. That's yeah, awesome. Wow, pretty, that's really cool. It's pretty funky, but like, oh, so you see the, the guy holding it? It's base, It feels like point and shoot. You know, I was like, going to say, uh, speaking in, the, in in guy holding it, look at this picture right here. I think this like visually tells the, 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 the point I'm trying to make. Like, yeah. look how awkward that hand grip is. Like, I feel, I feel he's about to drop it. It looks <laughs> like he's about to drop it. <laughs> You, you know what I mean? No, like, I get your point, I, though. Yeah, for sure. And so for me, it's, and I, I, I bet you, like, the technology is, is awesome. And I, I like insane. the Sony product. I, I really do like the Sony product. And I like the, the picture that comes out on the other hand. But I think that for the type of work that I do, I feel more um, covered with, yeah. like, a full on, full DSLR body. I think, especially, like, I was working with this actor on, the, on Thursday. And, it was it was kind of a fast shoot. Like like the the, the actor showed up at eleven thirty mm-hmm. and he had to leave at twelve. And I was like, wow, man, okay. And I have half hour with that person, and we need to nail like all the materials. We need to cover it, so I can't miss. I can't have any downtime. Yeah. And to be able to switch that fast between portrait and landscape, and like like it was to the point where like you're trying to rush so much that. Mm-hmm. You might, you might, you know, drop something or, or knock over something because we're we're almost like we're not running, but almost. And I felt that this sort of grip was more kind of practical in in some ways. Like the ergonomic of it are very practical. Like it's not like a delicate thing. It's like it it you know it feels like a, a Glock hand grip on on both sides. You know, it's like built built for combat. You know, like yeah. built for intense, I know intense scenarios. And and I feel that for the type of work that I do at the moment, I, f- I feel more kind of secure with something like that. But I will tell you this, though. Like, if I was to travel, oh, uh, something like a, a Sony A7S would be killer. Say no more, fam. Say yeah, no more. you know, like, you don't it. have... <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, that, that I, I would probably prefer to have something like that. Like, it's smaller. The ISO is more convenient. Oh, yeah. It's... Uh, the difference is the night and day. To me, you know, I used to... You know, when I had my Canon uh, to a limited amount of travel, I don't travel much, but to the limited amount of travels I had with Canon versus Sony, not even packing it. And, and like you literally can throw it in the backpack with lenses and it's not going to take much space versus like yeah. with Canon, it's a whole ordeal. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, tell me about it. Like, oh, my God, like the amount the amount of stuff that I had to bring to, to, to kind of put together the set that I that yeah. I put together on Wednesday 
I was like, fuck. That's the that's the one thing that I don't like about directing. I think it's just the amount of shit that you need to carry around, and and yeah. it, it feels like moving a house, you know, before and after work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, it's just so yeah. much lighter. It, like it, you put it on your shoulder with the strap. You don't even feel you have it there. You know, it's like you, for traveling, it's perfect. It has a silent shutter that works amazing. You can just shoot fucking hundreds of it's f like i don't know like for an average for an average user or even professional users that travel or any anything you do outside of the studio work i, I don't see a reason why would you stay with with canon maybe that's my bias but just like for me the difference was so huge i was regretting i had canon like i was like i i, I felt dirty that i had canon. <laughs> you know what i mean it's like when when something is so ex exponentially better uh, yeah, and you realize like, holy shit! Why? I yeah, there's there's no turning early. back. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally hear you. I, uh, I just noticed there's a there's a couple question in the feed there. Like I feel yeah. we got we got totally carried away, but I think for it's all good, man. I usually keep yeah. questions towards the end, so like whenever we we feel like you know we're running out of time, if so it's now then okay, we so, can do it now. So I think I think uh, one one that's definitely on on the topic. So. Uh, uh, Molnader here, a question for Jay, why do you prefer Nikon over Canon? Uh, it is definitely because of the ergonomics. Um, and I'll tell you like, like something that's so interesting is that I think I prefer the colors of Canon better. I feel that Nikon is a little bit sterile. I feel that it's trying to be like electronically perfect, whereas Canon has a little bit more of an emotional kind of butter uh, of how the color kind of blend together. I feel it's a more rich, it's a softer, kind of more buttery picture. But Nikon has a little bit more crisp looking, like more sterile kind of looking way to handle colors, which I feel is suited for visual effects. Like if you're trying to do like polarized textures or or more like kind of technical looking kind of work, I feel like Nikon is very well suited for this. But mainly it's the ergonomics and the way that the, where the buttons are placed and things like that. I feel like every time I've grabbed a Mark II, I couldn't believe how kind of awkward my finger grip was like mm -hmm. just to, like that the big rotating thumb wheel on the back and like it just felt I, I, I was surprised actually I was like wow I thought Canon would have figured that by now but the ergonomics of the Nikon was so much better and that's just my opinion it, it probably varies from people to people no but. you're not the first person that said that I, I've you know when I was you know researching cameras for the first time and there's always a, a battle of Canon versus, you know, Nikon. Yeah. And, and you know, I actually, I actually own both. So I'm like, I'm, I'm totally open-minded about it. Like I do, I have a, a Canon AF1 that uh, my dad gave me, which is an old school film camera. And then mm -hmm. I have the Nikon F4, which is the, the equivalent 35 uh, uh, film negative equivalent at the time. But when it comes to the digital, I think I've, I've, I like the colors better on the night on the Canon, but the the ergonomics are just killing me. Like just the product design of it. And but Canon looking at, has excellent lenses too, right? Like they have some of the best lenses out there. Yeah, easily. Canon. Yeah, definitely, definitely has great lenses. So you know, either way, I think at this point, it it'd be hard for me to switch because I got so many lenses and and stuff <laughs> yeah. that it it'd be hard to do like a, a religion a religious conversion like that. But. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So here's here's another cool question uh, from uh, Josh Norman here. So uh, where did you experience the most growth as an artist and what was it like and what do you think caused it? So um, I think that my biggest growth probably happened when I joined the Avatar team. And it was definitely because of the people around me. They were extremely competent and super cool and open to share. And it became this um, uh, very collaborative, brainstorming kind of way to, to approach concept art or CG or whatever. And w one thing that also fostered that super creative environment was that everybody on Avatar brings their own machine. So it's not like you got this corporate kind of budget per department that will roll you out like this, this yeah. basic box or that's whatever pretty standard in film in general like uh, that was a big yeah. su su surprise moment for me when i worked in the film for the first time in a studio yeah. environment it's like i'm bringing my own pc what 
Because <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I used to be at Naughty Dog and cried thinking yeah, like, yeah. in video games and for like it, past it, 15 years. Yeah, and it, it's like super controlled and, uh, you know, they, they control the software that you're using. And, and, you know, some days if your machine goes down, they'll bring you an, a, a, a clone of the exact same. Whereas whereas on Avatar, I, I bring all my own equipment and it's all a Mac. Um, I'm actually testing some of the latest uh, iMac Pros on behalf of Apple and it's awesome. And the fact that I can bring my own stuff allows us to get super customized with just about everything, whether it be the, the, the hardware or the software or, or et cetera, et cetera. It's almost like, you know, you can be like a cop where you get the basic Glock or you go special forces and everybody tunes up their own rifle and it mm -hmm. becomes this whole thing, you know, where everybody's got custom parts of this and that. And because everybody's exploring their own different route, well, it's like we get to see 10 different routes at the same time. So anytime someone discovers something great, like the whole team gets to benefit from that. As opposed to have 10 people walk the same path, you get, you know, you get each individual get to explore 10 different paths. So the learning curve is going gonna, is gonna to compound gonna, a lot faster doing that. So mm -hmm. I think that my, my biggest growth happened when I joined the Avatar team and it was because of the people and also because of the openness of the the business platform in terms of like you bring in your own computer because the people would like to share and um, also doing the lunch uh, sketches really, really helped out to, to really um, kind of compete a little bit in, in a way and then see <laughs> everybody because, you yeah, know, you guys I, were course, going crazy with that. I'm jealous. You know, <laughs> You know, it's like, of course, like after a lunch sketch, you know, everybody check what everybody did. And it was always this thing. It's like, what the hell? How did you do this? How did you do that? And everybody would share all the time. It's like, oh, you know what? I'm going to try that tomorrow. And and that's really when like like the compounding effect kind of um, uh, took place. So so that would be uh, hopefully that answers your question, um, um, uh, Josh. Um, I'll see. Let me see what else is in there. Um, yeah, do the work for me. Do the <laughs> okay, so question for Jay. In what order um, you acquired your skill and how your previous skills and connections helped for you to become a director and what was the crucial part in becoming a director? Okay, so this is a super cool question and thank you for asking that, uh, Melander. Um, so over dude, the... You're so Canadian, dude. <laughs> so like you're the... the the most Canadian right now. The what? Just super nice to everyone. Super well, Canadian. <laughs> okay, super Canadian. <laughs> well, um, okay. So, so no, but it is it is a really cool question because yeah, um, I can tell you, like something like deep with inside of me as a as a creative happened on that specific topic. It's like, am I pursuing directing because it's always like the next thing ahead or the next role on top of the last one, whatever, or it's actually the role that allows you to really combine everything you've learned before, or is it like challenge, more challenging, et cetera. And I can tell you with like, um, so I started as a concept artist, did matte painting, matte painting supervision, and then VFX art direction, and a little bit of VFX supervision. And then on the side, I did a lot of photography and a lot of color grading and then cinematography. And now when I look back, it's like, okay, well, do you want to focus on VFX art direction? Do you want to focus on VFX supervision? Do you want to own, do you want to open your own, you know, uh, ad agency, you know, whatever, or do you want to make feature films? And I can tell you that the one thing that has always been driving me the most is curiosity. Um, that's how I discovered color grading. That's how I discovered matte painting. That's how I discovered the pro photo lighting suite is that I would look at an image and I would be like, I don't know what it is in that image, but there's something that looks amazing that the current tools or processes at my disposal right now are not allowing me to get. So I need to know more. How do you get those highlights? How do you get that perfectly white light on your subject? How do you, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then that, my curiosity, I think, is what, you know, got me lost down the rabbit hole. And and directing became this thing where, well, not only I get to play with all my favorite toys and I get to, you know, kind of concept shots and play with cinematography and design lighting and play with time, 
it became this thing where, okay, all the technical process is kind of behind you in, in some, you know, uh, respective form. Now, how to tell a story and how to have, you know, the, the audience on the other side of the screen to kind of understand that story, first of all, like, are they understanding the message of what I'm trying to say? And are they compelled by that story? And are, are, are they like, like compelled with my views of the world? Became like a very fascinating thing to me because it's not only it encompasses all of the technical, you know, like gibberish of visual effects and, and production and whatnot. It also encompasses a lot of um, philosophy and human nature and just like storytelling and things that we all relate to. And then to me, that's almost like a new chapter. You mm -hmm. know, like when you when you play a video game and you're like, oh, you unlock new level. You know, it's right. like, oh, wow, that's a whole new thing that I don't know a whole lot about that is very interesting because to me again I think the curiosity is kicking in and I'm starting to read books about it and I'm starting to look at films in a very different way and and all of a sudden it's making my whole career new again so uh, to order your uh, to, to answer your question this is how I've acquired most of my skills was to follow my curiosity which was based on I would see a piece of art or a photograph or a matte painting or a film shot or whatever. And I would be fascinated by how it looked like. And I, I had to find out what went into the pudding. I was like, I need to, I need to know how that shit goes down because I want to be able to do that to my own stuff. And, and I think that by getting lost down the, getting lost in the forest by researching left and right, I think that over time, when you look back and you combine all these things together, it's like, well, no, now you actually know how to make the whole thing. So why don't you start directing? Because I think it's going to facilitate a lot of how the department kind of work together because you had a chance to kind of work with all of them and things like that. So um, what was the crucial point if, of becoming a director? And that's also another awesome question because that was a hard jump for me. And my friend Vitaly gave me endless shit about this. <laughs> it's like, it's like, and, and I, I kind of... I kind of have to owe it to him, like in, in a way. I want to kinda... hear that conversation because you are the nicest guy I know, one <laughs> of the nicest guys I know. And Vitaly is, Vitaly only hates one person, like not really hates, but n doesn't like only one person in this world. I'm not gonna say who, but he likes everybody. Everyone. Everybody. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I want to. Uh, I want. I want to hear how he's giving shit. To so, you. It's, it's, so, <laughs> and and we're we're and and for those who who don't know, it's like like Vitaly. I think is one of the guys I can say. I think he's he's one of my best friends because I I think that even when my girlfriend you know sees us interacting, is like you guys are like the group and then within the group is like when you guys start <laughs> talking together, is like people just stop kind of following because they just don't understand. It's like you guys are you guys are like like three levels of incent inception deep <laughs> into the conversation and then all of our inside jokes and things like that we're, we're just he's just one of those guys that we're so on the same wavelength it's kind of weird it's like it's almost like we were brothers from like another mother across the world right. and then we finally reuni reunited and and one day i've always been a big fan of like uh, academics and research and things like that because to me it's like i'd rather research and then learn how it works as opposed to do it and bang my head my head against the wall for like 16 hours mm -hmm. and vitaly is like kind of the opposite he's just like fuck it let's just do it <laughs> and and i'm like no 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 hold on like we're gonna read the user manual and then we're gonna nail it the first time as opposed to take 10 tries at it so it's like we have like this kind of paradoxical kind of approach about things on this regard which makes us kind of complementary in a, in a very interesting way and and eventually you know we, we were after the gym one night at the village when we were when we used to be neighbors and and i was telling him about this thing he's like okay i just discovered this thing that plugs into this, that, this that, that. he's like oh my god dude are you gonna stop up researching and just fucking press record on your goddamn camera or what like if you're not doing that i'm about to do it you know and and I was like, all right, all right, all right, fine. I'll direct something this weekend and, 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 and fuck it. Let's see where it goes. And, and I think that was kind of my, my breaking the ice sort of thing was just like my best friend just telling me like, oh my God, just do it already, please. <laughs> and I ended up like filming some completely random stuff at like a gym and whatever. And with some CrossFit uh, friend of mine. And, uh, and I think we ended up being like the first video on Instagram at the time. Like funny enough, like it, it, I directed that weekend, the weekend that Instagram came up with video 
and and he totally blew up like like crazy hundred thousands of followers and i was like <laughs> i didn't blew up and i directed the goddamn thing all right whatever it doesn't matter but uh, it, it was it was that the the specific moment for me was just to freaking do it, and you can film and you know James Cameron says that too. He's like you know if you want to become a director, pick up a camera, film something, edit it, and put your name on it, and then the rest is going to be negotiating your fee and then just getting better at it. And and that's funny enough. Like I got I got I totally lived by that credo too because that's like that's how I got started too. Because that that Nike spec commercial that I did got me the gig at Intuitive Surgical, mm-hmm. and then the gig at Intuitive Surgical got me the gig at Neuro, and then that um, had me like a little bit of exposure to start to work with some of the guys on the Navy Seals, and then that got me exposure to work on on some other projects, and. Because you got like something to show, and at the end of the day, you right. know, it's like if you if you can show it, people are like, "Oh yeah, you're the guy that did this." I was like, "Oh, you'd be great for that." And and to that note, cascades. It, it totally cascades. And to that note, is like be careful to pick something that you like because it will cascade. So, mm-hmm. so pick a subject matter that you're really into because you're gonna get more of the same uh, almost pretty pretty rapidly. So hopefully that answers your question. Like I ended up like gathering a baggage of skills by following my curiosity and my interest and um, they all happened to connect together and then uh, to do the switch over to directing was just about a matter of uh, renting a camera and filming some cool shits and put some music on it and see what happened yeah you you went at length it's just yeah exactly exactly do that and you know who else said to do exact same thing let me guess is the person we started to chat about when we started a podcast which is robert rodriguez oh is that right oh yeah oh, from yeah. the Re- rebel without a crew like he just started yeah. doing that he I, I remember listening to one of his po- it was one of his podcasts or maybe director's chair i can't remember there's just so many things i listen to that i keep to f- tend to forget a lot of things um or maybe it's me getting older but anyways um yeah he 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 said you know the the, the filmmaker is a person that actually films. <laughs> it's like whether you're a good film filmmaker or not, that comes down to experience and, and skill that you acquire, like depending on how you acquire. But but essentially, like once you start filming, you are a director. Whether you whether you believe that or not. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I, I remember him saying, like, you know, there's going going to be a time when kids will be able to pick up a consumer level camera, something really cheap. And we'll be able to film and become directors. And that's exactly what's happening right now. You can literally take your iPhone and become a director. You can mm. film on iPhone if you wanted to. Like the, the technology is already good enough to do films. You just have to edit them, obviously. Uh, you know, YouTube is a great example. You know, those are in the films on the highest level. But you can still see people trying their best to do short films. Uh, with like the limited budget, budget, just using their regular iPhone, like even iPhones, right? Oh yeah, you could so, make it. You can make an iPhone if you want. Yeah. So yeah, definitely that. Um, the only thing I would chip in, I guess, you know, you kind of explained that, and you know, Vitaly is a perfect, perfect example of like, yeah, just, just fucking do it. <laughs> just, yeah. Just, just don't overthink. Just do it. Uh, and it feels like it can be an overwhelming thing. And a lot of topics we discussed today. You know, we talk about working with professionals. Obviously, both me and you, we have a pretty lengthy experience when it comes to working in the industry, you know, yourself uh, directing as well and, and, you know, doing photo shoots, all that. Uh, but one of the one of the aspects of, of any profession is just not getting intimidated by the fact that something is pretty complex. Um mm-hmm. Because the reality is you can break everything down into pieces and then learn. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, over time, I, I feel like I s- com- I'm coming to a conclusion that there's two important skills that we learn. And once you, m- not master, but once you become familiar with, with the, the idea that those two skills matter the most, that's when you, you, you know, your brains opens up for for pretty much everything in that's, mm-hmm. that's that's at least my opinion one <laughs> is just the ability to learn uh oh yeah that's that's huge that's kind of funny because it sounds like oh yeah it's i mean we learn right like it's pretty obvious but no it isn't like the you, you just you just have to understand that when you're learning it will mean that you're gonna fail it will mean that you are 
you're gonna be you know you're not gonna know enough to be to be professional right uh, right from the get-go yeah there's there's just it's impossible so you you ability to learn is ability to accept accept the idea that you know nothing about the subject but you're willing to dive in and feel like a complete complete novice in that subject yeah right? and I, I think that's that's huge what you're uh, what you're touching on right now I, I was gonna say like besides you know besides the the learning and and whatnot i think that sometimes uh you know wh whether it be you're a student or, or starting in the industry or whatever like you know everybody gets intimidated about a task or another or a role or a job or or whatever like that i think that just happens to everybody and like the the thing is that like you, you you will fail no matter what and i fail all the time and it's okay because i'm gonna fix it yeah and and actually like failure is actually like we we seem to have such a, a negative kind of you know stigma around the the word itself even and it's like look it's like a failure is is almost like collecting information about how something works is like if if you're doing something for the first time i think it's kind of unrealistic to assume you're going to nail it uh, out of the park you know so it's like give yourself a little bit of a break and just like give it a shot and see what comes out and then you know like just collect the information and then you know repeat you know like like repeat and, and retry and then fix it and research a little bit more until you get the results that you want to get and, and that's kind of that's kind of what what I've been doing, to be honest. And it's like try to do that without the the loss of of in, enthusiasm. You know, like I think that I think that Winston Churchill had a quote that that had something in those lines. It was like success is the ability to go from failure to failure without the loss of enthusiasm. Yeah. So at the end of the day, the person who keeps trying that is you know remains optimistic about the craft. They're the one that are going to succeed because they just kept trying until until they figured it out. And then the, the truth is you will figure it out. Like, you know. Yeah. There's a lot of um, athletes that tend to say this a lot. You either win or you learn. Yeah, that's there's, right. There's no yeah. failure involved. And you know. I, I like that quote a lot. Yeah. You, you either win or you, yeah. you learn. And I feel, I feel that the importance of learning through failure is so much, it has so much more weight and understanding what the failure is in the first place because like if you if you fail and then blame everyone else for for the failure or feel shit like ah it's not for me and then just just give up and then you've learned nothing yeah that's um, super that's super lame <laughs> yeah it's it's very lame uh yeah but and, and also uh actually a little bit of a sign out there but you know between the the failure and things like that or or just kind of uh finding the the courage and the strength to to give yourself a uh, an attempt or, or whatnot there's a, another side note that i would recommend is like don't don't compare yourself either because i think that's a little bit unjust to do that because we all walk a different path we're all exposed to different experiences mm -hmm. and things like that and you know sometimes we find someone that has like compelling results and is like oh i want to do that too i want to and it's like yeah well maybe that person was you know at a specific place at a specific time that led to this and this and that and if you keep comparing yourself i think it's going to only lead to to disappointment and i think if you want to compare yourself because you know in in somewhat of a competitive outlook it, it does make sense like you could compare yourself to use competitive competition as a motivator if yeah. you were to do that then compete with yourself and then compare compare yourself to who you were yesterday and yes. and and just focus on the growth you know it's like you know what like yesterday i did a lunch sketch that was just absurd and that's okay because the one i'm going to do today is going to be better and yeah. and i remember like you know like I, I can show you my first lunch sketch that I, I did with the with the avatar team i think i think i can find it i was like man that was just brutal <laughs> it was just painful yeah it it's it's tough, man. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, it's super important to fail. It's super important to learn from failure uh, and, and not be too hard on yourself. And what you said is exactly what, what the best approach should be. You know, like you, you, tr you try to find to better yourself over time. And if, if whatever you do today will make your tomorrow better than today, that's already a progress you know um and you know i was i was touching upon failure because 
the more I think about the way we learn in general and what makes us to succeed is the the facing the reality of of doing something being bad at it not doing it good and then learning that you can do something better not just mm -hmm. listening to lecture you know there's everyone you know thinks that thinks that the lecture is the way we learn i don't think it I, I you know over time i don't think it is i think it gives you a blueprint on what what what's the best way of approaching certain certain aspects of you know uh if you're learning art and you're taking lectures, tutorials and gumroads, whatever that would be, it will give you a good idea, you know, how to avoid certain failures. But unless right. you actually try actually, it, yeah. yeah, you have to like not only just watch the lecture, but actually do it. Yeah, you have to do it. And uh, I can I can touch on that. Actually, that's something that just happened to me a couple of days ago. So I was doing some uh, some retouching on uh, some of the photography that I shot. And I just learned this kind of th this new this new method about you know doing doing something that I've I've never seen before that I thought was super awesome, and and I remember you know watching the tutorial and reading about it like about like a week ago, and then I I, I went about doing it like yesterday, and I was like ah oh, shit I actually don't remember the details, <laughs> but I didn't remember because I didn't do it and I didn't do it enough time to like, oh yeah, that's my new jam. I know how this goes, you know, whatever. But yeah. like reading it and, and getting by the information is not enough. You need to, you need to, you, you, you need to own it. Yeah. You need to practice it. You need to make it yours and, and you need, there's, there's no, there's no other way. You just got to get in and get some. Yeah. Imagine, imagine you overthinking about directing and never, never pulling a trigger you know like you would yeah, know technically yeah. what to do but you would never do it and like never had an experience never had those moments yeah. where you forgot your usb cable <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know and you I mean? know it's it's funny because like it's 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 totally something that um i i picked up from doing the sketches and i, I got some of the sketches here that um you know they're a little bit like earlier on and, you know, definitely the brushwork is not as good. And I was still using a little bit of photos to kind of cheat around. And Hey, who cares? And, yeah. Do you know anyone who doesn't use photos? Fine yeah, seriously. Anyone. But at, at the time, I think that, like, the emphasis was to, to you know, practice, you know, the calligraphy or the brush shedding. And right. here's one a little bit later that was like, okay, so that's kind of fun. Like, it's all brushes and mixer awesome, brush. It's still, it's still very crude, but I'm, I'm getting a little bit more into it. And then I think, like... Um, then I started to get into this stuff and I was like, okay, this is, this is starting to get really cool. I'm starting to fake the heat refraction with, mm. you know, a specific brush that I'm using. And even the lens flare is like all painted in and, and things like that. And it took a while, like, um, to, to just get comfortable with that stuff because that was not my jam. I was more like a math painter guy, like very photo, very back end, very visual effects, whatever. Right. It, it took me a while and it all came down to this one thing. I was You're like, in you know a what? Perfect environment to learn that, by the way. You have oh, absolute yeah. monsters when it comes to painting. Oh, yeah. When it comes to like John you. Park and Jonathan Bach and uh, Nick Jandro and all that, like these guys, they're, they're a lot better at that stuff than I am. And um, yeah, having a chance to, to be exposed to how they do it and then um, uh, compete a little bit, that was definitely the, the right environment. But it, it kind of came down to one thing. It was like, okay, first of all, just F it. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go, and I'm gonna give it my my best shot, and then I'm gonna post it. And it was called almost like an unspoken rule that if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do one, like you gotta post it. And it's almost like posting it made it official. That no, you this made a is statement. Where, like, well, not necessarily a statement. You it, to me at least, it was more like I've archived where I'm currently at. Right. In, in terms of my, you know, ability to do that in this particular time frame, because I think we're all kind of doing like a, it's about like half hour to an hour, I'd mm -hmm. say. Yeah. And what I meant is like you, 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 not a statement in a way of like, oh, this is me. It's like, no, I'm actually doing it. You know. Yeah. In, it in was like idea. you know when you when you look at a, a roadmap and it says like you are here and it's like oh this is what everybody else is doing that's fine and i, I recognize certain things in other people's schedule i was like oh i want to be able to do that that's cool i want to practice this and, and mm -hmm. day by day you just pick up this new visual cue that you kind of rehearse over and over and then eventually you 
you control it and then you move on to another one. But the, the posting it was this, this, this art archiving process of like you know like you are here and then it became like oh i'm gonna do one this weekend you know a little bit longer Mm -hmm. and um and then just like practice all these things that i mess up in my my last one or whatever and and back then but it was funny enough it was like if you have the courage to initiate the process and just do it if you have the courage to be true to yourself in terms like i'm gonna post it because this is where i'm at and I'll be able to look at where I'm at with a very true reflection, which is going to really much inform me of the thing I need to work on. And if I don't like that I posted that and that's where I'm at right now, well, freaking work on it and post one that's better. And the minute you post one that's better, it just kind of erases the one that's that was done before. Yeah. So if keep at doing that like every day eventually you know you'll compare your result from where you were a year from now and you're like holy shit and then i came richard a long way that's smith, right. though. oh yeah that richard <laughs> smith, like was that oh yeah. yeah yeah that's a total oh hey i, I called that's it a study an, yeah yeah that's a study right right after richard schmidt like just like that and and that that was a richard schmidt as well yeah. i called it here too yeah he's he's an awesome guy he's like yeah, an, his an, work is absolutely amazing he's like an and he's like a wizard. I was about to ask you, you know, because we're on a topic of, you know, you're basically as you're creating new work and learning, you know, trying to sort of put on yourself the idea that I'm not only just thinking about, you know, becoming better at sketching and, you know, thinking about brushwork, all of those things that uh-huh. make basically, you know, add the un- uniqueness to your work over time, because that's something you just have to practice. You cannot just just snap your fingers like, oh, I envisioned that I'll be unique and then it just happens. No, you're going to be influenced by everyone else's work and until you practice enough and find your own tricks, mm-hmm. it's very unlikely your work's going to be, you know, that much more original compared to someone else. Um, but I think there's something to something to say like when you're manifesting yourself by posting on social media, you know, I feel that there is a certain aspect to posting and I, I i really want to hear your opinion uh, about that because it it but it bugs me a little bit that a lot of people are tr- are uh s- steering away from the idea of sharing where they are at right now and not sharing in the way uh to impress but sharing because they want to make that manifest that manifest themselves of where they are at the moment are like i like you like you said i like should yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. that statement okay. of archiving that you know? that's a super good kind of topic and I, I have a little bit of dirt on that because i i felt like i, I kind of fell down that 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 trap before. i think everyone does including myself and like like when i was at blizzard I, I can tell you like it was like oh if i'm gonna post something it has to send the right message you know and i was like <laughs> totally totally overthinking it and, and it it actually ended up deteriorating my my ability because it's like like I don't know if it's like a self conscious thing you know and we're all self conscious in some some form or, or another um, but it was like you know it's like you're you're it's getting in the way of your practice it essentially yes. and and you get kind of cold and and stale about your your process and then eventually it becomes more and more unfamiliar and then you start to give it a try and because it's more and more unfamiliar then you're kind of rusty so then you're like eh, i'm gonna put it off you know an, an an extra week and you know and then it turns it to this like intimidation that turns into prost- procrastination and and whatever mm. whereas the sketches was this thing that it it totally made it familiar again and it totally made me super comfortable again and it totally rolled over in the the avatar work too that was like oh wow you know like before i would overthink a painting a lot and like you know take a little bit more time and doing it and really apply myself and then i started doing the sketches and it was like oh those are rough they don't they don't really matter and it was like well what is rough about it it's like well this here is not really thought through it's like oh well okay well fix that in like two minutes and then oh this right here looks a little soft it's like well okay well texture that in like two minutes and then eventually it became this thing where like the, if I was to add a little bit more time in the sketches, they became kind of almost like rivaling my my longer production pieces that I would do, mm-hmm. e- except that the sketch had like a cooler energy to them. Yeah, 
And and then I realized that it's like, oh, you know what? Like some of my production work was almost kind of overworked. You know, I kind of over noodled it like here and there or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it became this thing that it, it basically doing all the sketches all the time kind of shook off the the intimidating aspect of doing a new task or whatever. And it's 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 just don't overthink it. Just jump right in and get going. And then before you know it, you'll have something cool. And if it's still too loose, then just touch it up here and there and put it to bed and move on to the next one. And then you look back, you're like, actually, this piece is kind of pretty cool. Like, and and I guess a lot of it was like the mental battle of just like overthinking is like, oh, you know what people are going to say? Is it going to look as good as blah, blah? Yeah, and do you even pay attention to that at all? Like these days? Because I'll tell you, I did, sure, like, but I, not I, anymore. I, I really don't. Like, I don't at all. Like, I have such another kind of outlook on things like I'm... Um, like I, there, there are so many people out there now that are you know posting constantly new this and and, and that and once in a while I'll, I'll save a piece that someone else did because i'm like ah you know that gives me an idea or that i find that's inspiring or whatever mm -hmm. but I, i'm not gonna kind of compare myself and and sort of you know like over consume myself of like oh where i'm at this person did this and this and that and i, I don't find any kind of inspiration in that whole train of thought like to me is like like i i and I can I can show you right now. It's like I I'll browse like Google or Tumblr, and I I just find like random shit. Like sometimes it's like oh yeah, some backgrounds from uh, I think that Bear movie from DreamWorks. Brother like Bear. yeah, Brother Bear. And I was like that that movie has one of the best you know background background paintings. Yeah, and I, I came across that painting. I was like, man, those colors are insane. Okay, that like next time I do a painting at that time of day, I'm gonna try that. Or this is some uh, some photography that you know I was driving by Long Beach. I was like, wow, that sodium lighting looks insane. I'm gonna capture that and I'm gonna use mm -hmm. that in a painting some sometime. And that's that's how I get inspired. Or look at this guy right here with his with his pod racer set up in a in an airport warehouse. I thought that was hilarious. But I look at this. I'm like, dude, I love this machinery. I love these tones. I love these colors. And I I could like bust out like a mech sketch out of that palette yeah and and it's awesome and that's kind of where i find my inspiration now as opposed to kind of regur re regurgitate like everything i see on our station and whatever like it's just <laughs> like it's 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 cool to see like what people are up to and the level of quality and things like that but i don't thrive on that i think i'm mm. i'm more kind of doing my own thing you know like i was like oh that's a cool you know, color grade, you know, all the black levels are lifted. I'm going to do that on my next piece or, or whatever. Yeah. So I'm not as consumed with it anymore. I'm just kind of focusing on doing my own thing. And I, I actually find my a lot of my inspiration in like the weirdest places. Like, I don't know if I've ever showed you that. But like for those of you that are listening, this is a total insider, um, insider uh, uh, hookup right here. But if you go onto, I ah, see it's not even on my website. That's why. That's why it's like ultra secret. But if you go to Tumblr, yeah, bro. right? Okay. If you go to Tumblr and then you do a search for, I think it's Ruby Films. I think is my is my thing here, my jam. And if you go into archive, there's just like the most insane collection of the coolest shit. From graphic design to photography to color palettes to mech design to, you know, you name it. And it's like, look at this shit right here. Like, how cool is that? Yeah. Like, just like insane makeup, you know, like some Picasso version of a makeup and photography. And look how awkward the time of day is. All the lighting is all green. Like, that's rad. Like, I want to do, like, if I was to do character work and or present concept art, I would do it like with, with this sort of palette. Like, that's cool. Mm. and or look at this right here isn't that the craziest thing like i don't know i don't know what the hell that is but it's like the plastic like the isn't that, trans isn't that power rangers is it Maybe. or like some some crazy battle cat and it was yeah. like this thing yeah. this thing is so insane like the the pink transparent plastic where the edges are kind of you know almost like incandescent glowing it was like that's just a sick looking shader I'm, i should do something with that one day or um or look at this one right here like this palette all together. Look at the background and like how cool the plane is and the shadow and then the background's all warm. But yeah, so I look at things like that a lot more than I look at ArtStation for two reasons. Because 
my interpretation of these inspiration will end up being my own voice. And I don't want to kind of stress myself with like who's who's doing what and whatever. I, I couldn't care less, to be honest. Like I'm just pursuing kind of my own kind of curiosity and things like that. Like, look at this shit right here. How insane is that shot? It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Isn't that isn't that crazy? Yeah. So yeah, that's how that's how I go about like finding my inspiration now, uh, as opposed to kind of look at our station. When I was younger, I would you know check out who's doing what and you know who's good and who's got a certain style and try to emulate that. Yeah. And you know you get like you, you know you get like twenty John Parks out there and twenty Jamie Jones out there, and it's like I I don't see anything cool in that because they're all the same. Uh, at least Hundreds the real John Parks. babies. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, and it's like. It's like to me, if you're gonna do the whole hard surface thing, you know, like Vitali is doing, it's like, well, look at this guy right here, like he's uh, he's different, you know, like he's doing his own thing. That doesn't look like Vitali's stuff, and it's all cat, and it's awesome. It's like, dude, I respect that. That's awesome. You have yeah. your own voice as opposed to kind of like follow and 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 compete and duplicate and emulate to try to be the same. I'm like, if you're capable of doing that, why don't you listen to your own voice and see what 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 inspires you because to me that's the that's second row image in the middle fuck it's so good which one uh october 20 2018 okay it's like little in, little right this one middle. yeah this is like the best out of everything Easily. you're an idiot, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> i don't um, even know why that shit's on there <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding yeah it's super cool um, you inspire me man you inspire me just like that and that's why i keep your i keep you. your stuff I think that looks freaking awesome. It's super. I'll, I'll say this: uh, I really like what you said when you when you do a sketches. It's like putting an archive, like uh -huh. archiving your work. I think that's that's such a um, uh, healthy approach to to work because I you know the reason I asked you about you know posting on social media and I, I think it relates to quite a lot of artists, including myself, because when you post, you like to get the validation. I think a lot of us are often uh delusioned by the fact that the validation from others means that our work is good or not um and something you learn over time very quickly actually if you work in the industry is that uh oftentimes what you consider or what others consider to be really cool work uh and they'll you know click hundreds or thousands of like and you feel very validated that you've done something that you know people like in general <laughs> Uh, very often just do does not translate to work at all. And I found, you know, from the experience that I have, pretty much the work on average that, that, that has the least amount of interest from the general public is actually landing me the most amount of work. You know yeah, I, mean? I see a little bit of a, of a difference there. Yeah, well, yeah, there's something to say about like whatever is global that, you know, is I guess it liked. applies to like obviously if 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 you if you create very popular images, it's gonna catch someone's attention, right? Yeah. But that does not mean generally that's going to be the most original thing. Uh, I think I think people get caught up with the idea that the amount of likes <laughs> or the amount of validation you get from social media or generally people, yeah, uh, is 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 like uh is basically you know the only the only thing that you should care about or like it it it, it has it has a perception of be of being more significant than it, that it really is i guess that's the point i'm trying to make yeah and I, I would agree with that like i think like the the whole support that you might get from from the other side of the you know the the social you know mirror if i can say um i i, I would definitely say to to not use that too much as a as a guidance, because I'd say do stuff that makes you happy and do stuff that, you know, makes you proud of. And, and again, like do things that are, are better off than how they were yesterday, I think is mm -hmm. the most. And, and the more, I think the more true to yourself you are in regard of that, I think that the, the people and the feedback that you're going to attract is going to be that much more true to what it is you're looking for. But if you're, if you're trying to be someone else, like you might end up you know, getting feedback that that also kind of belongs to someone else that might not resonate as much with you, and and what's truly like deep inside your heart. But if you, if you do like the dopest stuff that according to you, and then the 
job that you're going to get or the people you're going to connect with, at least it's gonna, all going to be in line with what it is that truly resonate with you. And I think that to me is going to lead more towards like a more prosperous path. Uh, mm-hmm. overall you know because you're going to end up meeting people that you're actually going to see eye to eye with and then get along with because it's like well man we like the same shit it's like well yeah because i've been very consistent and true to myself about what it is i like to post and and it led me to you know this job and meeting this team as opposed to just kind of doing what's popular you know to to get a job or something because like like i don't know like like i've, I've had my chance to to be involved in hiring quite a bit and then most of the time most of the time you want to look, you want to look for, for fresh ideas, you know, like, yeah. like, like th- this guy right here, like that's an image I like a lot. Um, because like we've seen, you know, like how many hundreds of mechs, you know, in the military, you know, thing going on, but like this guy right here has a totally unique spin on it. And I'm like, that's cool. You're cool. You're very unique. You're very different. You kind of right. stand out. That's awesome. You know? Yeah. Whereas that, whereas that this guy right here is a complete phony. <laughs> Yeah, who is this guy? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Who so for, 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 for those who, for those who don't guy? know the detail, Mathieu, which I'm talking to right now, did this image. I'm just giving him a hard time as a, as a, no. friendly, as a friendly joke. I, mean, I like this honestly, image a lot. Too, I, I think it's a masterpiece, but I can see why you're not liking it. You know, it's no, 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 no I, I do like it. And <laughs> you, you see, like, I do like it. And that's how I, I validated that I like it because you're on, my, uh, you're on my blog. But so, yeah, so to come back to your question, I think I would... I would so I would kind of back off from the, you know, try to follow what everybody else is doing on our station. There's, there's a, there's a, there's a good kind of competitive factor that kind of echoes, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, like people are capable of doing this now and this amount of time with this tech, you know, whatever. So that's good. It's a good metric. It's a good, um, you know, uh, um, uh, self kind of checkup is like, Oh, okay. That's where the standard is now. So that's good to know. Uh, it, to, it keeps everything in context. But I wouldn't let it to kind of, you know, over consume your own creative voice because, you know, that's yeah. what that's what's going to make you the most happy. I think at the end of the day is to, is the, you know, to do the, the shit you're into. Mm. I think it's a good note to end this podcast on. That's like awesome. a really powerful note. Uh, I know there's quite a few more questions that we didn't address, um, but I'm pretty sure we're going to have Jonathan coming back to the podcast sometime later you know we we talk we talk a lot usually just like share cool stuff uh or just catch up over time (laughs) but yeah jonathan is always welcome to come back and i'm pretty sure we'll we'll organize something to to have more more qa and whatnot but it was a pretty good was a pretty good one man was really nice to catch up with you again and um we should grab dinner for sure yeah, I'm totally down. And then uh, for those of you that uh, are interested in uh, knowing uh, a little bit more about what I do, uh, you can you can you can always reach out into uh, any ways any ways uh, you can think of. I'm on the LinkedIn, Instagram, you know, uh, YouTube channel, uh, Bruby Films, and all that. And then uh, and then if you are uh, very much interested about my process, you can also look at, I got a couple of gum roads that I've done a little while back. Yeah. Let's plug uh, those in, man. You also have yes, Patreon, Patre- Patreon that you have. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to see how to switch to buying. I think I need to do this to be able to see them. And then I need to search for myself. I think, right. yeah, I did the Patreon thing for a little while and then, the, and then the gum road and it's, it's, it's interesting, but yeah, these, uh, these, um, products right here these are tutorial how i go about the, doing the sketches and then how i go about like doing the slightly more intricate matte painting which is a little bit similar to the one i'm working on right now uh, using 3d and whatnot and uh, so that should answer you know all the technical question about how i go about managing my layers or or what software i use and things like that so awesome. that would be uh, jonathan Bruby on gumroad if if that helps and then if not you can always shoot me an email and i'll try to uh uh, reply you if I uh, manage to do so. Perfect. Sounds good. If there's anything else you want to plug in, feel free, obviously. But yeah, it's. Oh, yeah. Check this out. I got something that's freaking awesome. So I started this fashion label a little while back. So that's kind of fun. I'm still working on that. There's Aaron yeah. Beck sporting, yeah. sporting my stuff. Um, we're all ha- out of hats. I think that the hats are, are out. Sold but. Out. The, but the mugs kind of came in, and these are rad. We got a Dude, black on black. Look, yeah. Those look fresh. 
Yeah, they're super dope. I'm going to give you one. I, we have a black on black that's all murdered out. It's like a gloss black on flat black. It's super rad. We got the military green version. FDA um, approved? That's FDA approved. so legit, bro. Super legit. <laughs> and then, uh, so yeah, there you go. So shameless uh, plug I there. Can, I can attest to quality because I was at your place and I seen the the apparel and everything you have there. Uh, I touched it with my sweaty Oh, hands. yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one is super. Yeah, this one is super nice. That's like a that's like a legit like vintage like uh, try on blend. Like it's super soft and super nice and yeah, all vintage it's print. Really good quality stuff. So. It's awesome. Super fun. So there it is. Awesome, dude. Again, uh, thanks for thanks for being here, man. And that was super nice to catch up with you. Um, awesome. Cool. All right, guys, let's wrap it up. Uh, I'm going to plug in, uh, obviously, Learn Squared. There was quite, quite a few questions when it comes down to design and art. Um, you know, Learn Squared would be one of those places where you can find all of that. And it's done by what I consider the best, you know, artists, designers uh, of the industry. We like literally filter through who's available and, and, and try to get their voices uh, available, available for you guys. I strongly believe that if you want to get an education, you want to get an education from someone who works in the industry. And that's what we offer. Um, obviously, Jonathan offers that as well with, with, his, with the Gumroad videos. You, should, you guys should definitely check that out as well. Those are pretty, I would say, fresh <laughs> uh, as well. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. Um, and yeah, have a good night, good day, good morning, wherever you are. And thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Ciao.